Don't forget to follow My Warp Life on Instagram to hear when new things are coming and enter one of our monthly giveaways. That's right. You know, you can win yourself a t-shirt and a beanie, which I don't have yet, or even a bottle of Kevin Lyman's hot sauce, which I do have, and it's fantastic. So don't forget, if you have any questions for us or topics you want us to discuss, text us at 818-863-6445. And if you enjoy listening to the conversations with our guests, you can hear the full versions of all the interviews on our Patreon for only $5. We donate all the proceeds to our favorite charities and you can cancel any time hey tony how you doing hi kevin what's going on we're, what's going on we're in my studio we're in diego and tony's studio we have no power at my home that's right <laughs> your house got wasted greenhouses in the neighbor's backyard the pictures man <laughs> did we get a windstorm yeah the basketball courts in the middle of the pool Ooh. and uh yeah it's gonna be a, a lovely uh cleanup for the next few days yeah but it's nice to have everybody here and you can yeah. even see the producer in the background yeah. he's over there on diego's kit what's yeah. up <laughs> yeah we're, so we're hanging out we're gonna knock out a couple episodes today this episode i'm excited about because i know we're going to be talking about bus drivers. We're going through this flux of the business. We lost a lot of drivers. They've gone on to do other things. So the company, so the companies are recruiting drivers, and a lot of those might be coming up from the people who are driving bandwagons right. or now bus drivers. I think it's not as rough as it was six months ago when people were starting to talk about coming back to work. I think they're starting to fill those voids because I'm booking a couple buses for a project I'm working on right now, and it'll be going out in the fall, and I was able to not to have too much trouble finding them. What I, I'm getting at is I think things have changed in that, you know, a single band may be in a bus uh, and going from one venue to the next, but the days of massive caravans with a lot of bands going in a row in the same direction, has that has that gone away? Is that not a thing anymore? I don't know if we'll, we'll ever see something as, as large scale as some of those large, like Ozfest or Mayhem Fest or some of those things we did. It seems like you could find a bus, but the hardest part is finding bus drivers. Like finding them, actually, like, I want to interview you for my podcast. You have to realize many of these people still communicate, like, by flip phones and don't have <laughs> voicemail. So I did want to interview a couple. We're going to talk about some of my favorite bus drivers. But really trying to get an interview with them was almost impossible. I want to thank, you know, the people who came in and, and did this. I've got Jamie from GAGM Coaches, Judy Teagert, who had a very interesting story how she got involved in the best business. Stephen Copeland and Walter Trasher. My bus driver that everyone knows is Mikey, Mikey Jams, for many, many years. And we became very close friends and we still keep in touch a lot. You know, sometimes I don't remember the first time I meet someone, but I asked Mikey, how did we end up connecting? Because I, you know, I had different drivers for many years and all of a sudden, I end up with Mikey, and we were, we were together for, you know, quite a long time. I remember the first time I drove up, I was in an old, it was a 1999 uh, bus, and I pulled up, and they said they were giving out numbers at this huge tour. I'm like, okay, well, I'll just sleep until they knock on my door. They knock on my door, and uh, they had me a number one. And I thought, wow, number one, bus one? What the hell? So I get on, and here comes Kevin on the bus, and I'm like, hey, how's it going? I, he didn't know me. I didn't know him. I didn't know where I was at, what I was doing. Jumped on the bus, and I was like, okay, cool. So we, we take off, and we've got – we've kidnapped several people, I'm sure of it. And so we're driving down the road, and I hear noises and, like, people talking in the back, and then I see the door pop open. Hey, man. We need to go back to the venue, man. So-and-so left their wallet. <laughs> and I didn't know Kevin at all. I was like, man, what? Back to the... I said, man, that's going to cost you an overdrive to go back to the venue. We were like probably 20 miles out of the venue, right? He said, oh, don't worry. He just reached in his hand and just gave me a wad of money. I don't know tell him what, what was in there. I can't even remember now. And I was like, oh, okay, you the boss. We turned around. <laughs> went right back. We got it. Uh, I got to be honest with you, Kevin, for two or three years, I was wondering, well, is, is he like me enough to, am I going to come back next year? And then I'd get the call. He said, he wants you back. Two years and three years and four years and then five years. And then one day I heard Kevin in the back and I heard him talking on the phone. He said, you know, I think I might have found my driver. And if he, if your camera hadn't been on, I'd been in the front going, 
<laughs> and from that day on, man, I, I we just we did it for what? Uh, 18, 18 years. years. Holy shit. So yeah. you didn't finalize on your driver until five years in. And then he stuck with you for a full 18 years? Yeah, we uh, we did tons of tours. And, you know, we became like family. My first driver was um, a guy named Chris. And, and he, I loved Chris too, right. you know. But Chris, I didn't realize tour buses went any slower than like 94 miles an hour. Chris was a lead foot. <laughs> and all the other drivers would be asking like, we can't, and I, I didn't we can't keep up. up, can't keep up with this guy. When me and Chris parted, I went through a couple little drivers here and there that drove little segments. And I was doing Taste the Chaos, and I was doing Sprite Liquid Mix, and then all of a sudden, you get me and Mikey, and, and we're talking about music, and we're talking about fishing, and, and trust me, it's, it's one of those things where I always say, like, me and Mikey don't have the same political beliefs, but we could always find common ground. I'm very curious about the political beliefs of the bus drivers. And, you know, water cash is a hell of a first impression. One of the habits I had, I think I drove them a little little crazy with sometimes. You slept in the front. <laughs> Matter of fact, I remember the night we left somewhere. We're going to Houston. And this was, I had to find this out too, but he was over here talking with me. And we were talking, we were going and all of a sudden I look over, he's out. And I said, hey, Kevin, boss, nothing, man. So I was like, okay, well, he'll get up in a minute. Man, we drove. It was like an, a long drive. I mean, it, it was a long drive. <laughs> we get to Houston, and the sun pops up. He pops up and goes, oh, okay. Out the door he goes, get to work. And I was like, man, are you kidding? Who is this guy, right. man? Are you kidding me? I can't work like that, you know? Yeah, I slept on the floor Why? of the bus. I don't know. It was just like fall asleep on the floor. It had because, a bed in it, right? It did. It had a bed. I had a nice bus. But, you know, I'd, I'd fall asleep. You know, you're so tired on the road and everything, but... You know, that was kind of the flow you kind of get in with your people. I'd say, Mikey, we're going to go here and go fishing on a day off. Or I want to check out this lake. And we, we took that bus down roads that probably buses shouldn't have gone oh, down. Sure. We almost got them stuck one time out in uh, Cape Cod. We went out to Daryl Eden, actually. His parents had a house in Chatham. And we were going down this thing. And it was the closest, I think, we got to a point where we couldn't actually turn the bus around. <laughs> it took about a... 60 point turn to get it turned around on this dead end road. And Mikey met every challenge. I mean, Mikey, we got to this point where we were hauling a van around because normally you depend on runners and things to get right. people to hotels. And he just said, look, can I bring a van and I'll run a little side business. So he'd bring a person out and use it as a shuttle van, you know, before Uber and stuff. He was industrious, but there was one challenge that Mikey really had a hard time with. I tried. I tried my, I'm a good driver. Yeah. You know, like the rain, man. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. I'm a Definitely really good driver. Driveway. Really yeah. good driver. How was Fran on the bus? <laughs> like the rain, man. No, no. When Fran got on the bus, it was my mission because uh, Chrissy Hines got on the bus and said, I cannot sleep on the bus. I just, I fly all the time. I can't sleep on the bus. And I was like, it's my mission then. Mm -hmm. They're going to sleep without the pump <laughs> carbon dioxide in the yeah. thing, you know? So we go, and she they end up falling asleep on the couch, you know? Okay. So I'm like, Shh, I got this. Fran comes along, I'm like, Shh, don't worry, I got this. Don't worry, Fran, you'll, yeah, you'll be good. 18 years. She never slept on the bus no, while I was driving. No, I was right. kind of offended, to be honest with you. I was like, man. It's fun to have your family out and everything, but she was so, like, she'd go to sleep, and then she'd wake up like, Doors are open. <laughs> Eight bands had already played. It's like you, man. She's busybody too. She ke keeps moving. She'd come out for like a max, like two, three days. And sometimes I'd just walk on the bus and say, book John a flight out today. Get you home. And she'd be like, thank you. See you. And they'll go back to sleep right after we parked, you know? Mikey still drops by, still comes through town every time he can. We have a great time. And we had a great time on the road. We still meet up in Florida to go fishing when we can. Now, he was the one that was on the lead bus, right? But how many buses would you say on average throughout the years? We would have about 20 production buses. Wow. So that would be carrying my crew, production people, sponsors, all those kind of people that directly related to the show. We could have up to 40 or 50 band buses. And then you'd throw on top of that band wagons and then your vans. So we'd be up into about, I think they'd always give every vehicle a number. And I think we peaked out like 130, 140 vehicles. That's incredible. So you think about it, your, that tour that you did every year was its own moving economy. And it was a tour that was moving very fast. fast. It was very fast. You know, you think of most bands, they, you know, a lot of bands will do three days on, one day off, two days on, one day off. We were 
we were doing up to 20, 24 days in a row. <laughs> and by the end of that tour, you know, everyone was a little crusty. <laughs> and a little hot, as I remember. It was a grind. So, you know, Mikey had some reflections on the grind. We've been every parking lot from here to Canada. Every every venue parking lot. And that was the, that was the strangest thing. Going to a venue. Oh, we're going to the... Um, Mile High Stadium. I'm like, oh, sh man, I get short power there. I pull up and there's 96 buses lined up under the <laughs> under the bridge, and they're saying, no, no, we're not doing the stadium. We're setting it up in the parking lot. <laughs> You're not the first person to say that. Right. <laughs> so right off the bat, it was a totally different monster, and, I, and I'm I'm sure that there's a lot of people that got trained up in a good way to where they're just killing these tours nowadays because of the warp to because everybody nobody wanted Kevin to get out of the bus and start picking up trash you know nobody wanted Kevin to have to I've seen him in the booth selling tickets I've seen him putting barricades up and that was a thing if Kevin Lyman gets out before you to do your job you better tighten up a little bit people go what do you miss about it I go I actually miss the bus drivers a lot of times the bus drivers just had to wait for a hotel because we were coming overnight they had to wait till the rooms cleared the next day for people. So one of the tricks I kind of had come up with was I created the driver's lounge. And the driver's lounge was in front of my bus, one or two pop-up tents. Before I would go to bed each night, I would ice down drinks for them. I would put beers and sodas. I had beach chairs. I would set that up in front of my bus. So a lot of times, like as soon as the bus stopped, I would get out in the morning. Mikey would give me a hand and we'd get it all set up. So as the driver started to park up, they all came over and started gathering. So it was funny. One of the things I did was also I got a newspaper delivered. That was I wanted a local newspaper. So the local promoter rep was asked, please have two newspapers, a national and a local, for Kevin in the morning by his bus. That's the only thing I asked for, really, special. So the newspapers were always there. And I knew that I could, could leave them on the chairs. Because most of the drivers never had read a newspaper, so I oh, knew they weren't. I knew on. they weren't going to do. However, there you go. He's kidding. No, Kevin's it's kidding. no, it's true that. So I'd leave the papers there. Say to help yourself, hang out and read them. We would catch up on what happened on the drive. And I'm not. It's not just, but they just didn't read newspapers. Yeah. So because they'd probably been listening to radio all the way there. But there was one guy, and and, he, and I was able to track him down. Stephen Copeland uh, was a guy who actually would sit there and read the newspapers. So uh -huh. I, it was funny when I got to catch up with him, I was thinking about that, that he was one of the two or three out of the 20 bus drivers that would scoop that up in the morning. But it was a grind for him too. I drove on Warp Tour production people. Um, I believe the last year I did it, I had uh, your stage managers and you know people like that. And then the year before that, I had sound people, sound men. Um, Warp Tour <laughs> was hard. Um, it's a really hard schedule. Um, you're leaving at, you know, 1030 at night. And because you have to, you know, you have to be there by what, six, seven in the morning, usually. So you're not leaving at two, three in the morning, you know, so to leave at 10 o'clock at night, you have to force yourself to go to sleep at two in the afternoon. And it's, it's, it's hard, you know, um, it's easy to park. You know, Warp Tour for us was always easy to park. There's no days off ever. And if there was a day off, it was, you know, because it was 1,800 miles or something in between shows, you know. It wasn't a day off to just sit and do nothing. So one of the things that you don't really think about when you're listening to these stories is their schedules as opposed to yours. You're wiped out. You're asleep. You get there at 6 in the morning. You start building stages. Those guys have to hit and drive all night. Well, they go to the hotel. They're the only people that got hotels every day. I see. Because when you said, you know, as soon as I get out of the van, I put a lawn chair out, the papers out, but I also set out beers for them. I'm thinking, that's pretty early in the morning to have a beer, but they've been driving all night and they got to go to bed. They're on a reverse schedule. Yeah, that, I They're didn't realize They're on a totally reverse that. schedule. So we were usually getting them in by 10, 11 o'clock, maybe noon. Still, we would be leaving until 10 or 12 that night. So you get your eight hours of sleep. You get a little Yeah, but nap. what a jacked up schedule that is. That's hard to get your head straight around that. Their lives definitely are, are completely reverse of what you're out on tour. So there's some of these people that, you know, they're, they've been doing this for many, many years and, and it's how you do these schedules. I caught up with Harlow, who was one of my bus drivers and Warp Tour was a hard tour, but I was always like, certain people always came back. Of course, there was driver drama. Like, you know, all the bus drivers I know 
we're used to kind of dealing with maybe one or two drivers and we'd be dealing, you know, with, I guess they're the first year, I think <laughs> there were 70, 80 buses out there, but everyone helped everyone out. Um, I mean, of course there was drama and all kinds of uh, good stuff like that, but for the most part, everyone helped everyone out. We all fixed each other's buses. And Jimmy said, you know, if you could do the work tour, you could do any tour. It was overwhelming to me just to, just to deal with so many di- different bus drivers. I'm kind of uh, cute to myself a lot. So I'm used to kind of dealing with one band, but to to see all those uh, bus drivers and all those buses, it was it was mind blowing. I mean, it was pretty it was pretty awesome. We had people that were out there that you know we wouldn't have made it with someone named this. We had a gentleman named Boo who was out on the tour, and he knew how to fix a bus, do anything to keep a bus moving. Mm. Boo was one of those people that you could. Like I find, a, I saw him find a scrap piece of metal on the ground, refabricate it, put it on a bus, and get us to the next venue. And it was all these people fit certain roles out there. And Warp Tour was, you know, when, when he talked about you know drama or anything, one of the things you're going to find, Tone, is the bus drivers. They had their own set of communication, and they would be talking on their radios all day. So, you know, that thing telephone when you say one thing in someone's ear, it goes to the next person. Yeah. These people were notorious for this, you know? <laughs> the Department of Transportation, we talk about all the time. They're in charge of trucks and buses on the road and the rules. So one of those things, I'd, I went to bed one night and I came up and Mikey goes, we've all been told that they're gonna put roadblocks going through New Mexico and stop all the buses for not having the right permits and right things. I'm like, what are we, we're, gonna, we're about ready to go through New Mexico. He goes, a lot of them are gonna drive around New Mexico. I know exactly who would be at the head of all the disinformation. And as you uh, familiarize yourself with, you know, how tours work, you learn to ignore those people as much as possible and to be able to spot them. But yeah, those guys were always hilarious though, to sit and listen to their lies. You gotta realize these guys used to be all cowboys, okay? Early days of touring was pretend your bus is a motor home with a family on it. So that was one way to get through. Then there's fuel permits and taxes. And now you pay them all online before you, you used to have to stop at the entry point. You pass it when you go into a state and walk in and, and pay for a permit to go through the rest of the highway. Come on. Can you hear it in your head? He's and down, loaded up yeah. and trucking. We're going to run the scale. We're going to run the scales. Let's get through. Smoking you know. out your ears. Do they talk? Come on. Tell me they did some of that CB language. That would have been bitching. Absolutely. I mean, you know, Marble Mouse. But there was one of the greatest fears about anyone being on tour. You don't want to leave people anywhere. And I was driving these guys. That one, one guy was like, yeah, I was in Europe once and I got left behind at a, at a rest stop. You know, an American in Italy left behind at a rest stop in his underwear. You know, <laughs> how, how how are you going to coerce, convince anyone to give you a phone, you know, to let you make a call? Because I can imagine no worse situation, you know. I mean, I hear stuff like that all the time. And people think being a bus driver, you, you've, you've, you've seen all this crazy stuff, you know. And maybe that was true 20 years ago, you know. But and now it seems like people just want to, you know, the guys I drive generally, it seems like people are married, you know, so they like and, and the internet now and Facebook and Instagram, like pictures, people like there's not like people are on their very best behavior and people just want to get home. And, you know, the, I, I'm sure there's bands out there that still party, you know, but generally people, I think, just want to get home and not die. <laughs> He's right. That kind of sucks. The good old days of rock and roll when you used to do a, a line of Coke was a real line of Coke. In one way, I really glad there wasn't, cameras around for this. Mikey reminded me of something that we used to do on the bus once in a while. So there was nights on the buses where like you'd have like your friends out. Like, you know, it'd be like your friends would be traveling with you. And, you know, later on, I got pretty much I was asleep. I was tired. But the first few years Mikey was with me, I saw that energy and you're trying to burn off that energy at the end of the night. So we'd have this game in the bus and, you know, in Pompolona, you run the bulls I've like down that. the alleys. Yeah. Well, we played running of the bulls on the bus with all the <laughs> everyone on the bus, and basically you. Lock, <laughs> That's the craziest thing I've ever seen. You would line up at the end of the hall, and 
everyone would be hanging out, and you'd go, run to the bulls, and you'd run down the bus, like bull, like a bull. I'd go down and like buck people into their bunks, into the walls. Into the, people were cracking mirrors. I think we had, you know, the you only time the- I ever damaged the bus was like doing one of the other bulls. I guess you had to do something on the road. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're talking about big lines of coke, know. and I'm like, we're like playing running of the bulls. <laughs> then I was telling, you know, Mikey another story about Chris Nichols one time, and Chris was a fabulous person, but he had some issues of his stuff. Eventually, I had to, to let him go, but uh, we were talking about another story that was pretty funny. I had never really been on tour. I'd been on Lollapalooza, mm-hmm. but my own, this guy, Chris Nichols, drove my bus, and everyone came, one day the bus drivers came to me and said, Buses don't go 95 miles an hour. Eventually, Chris got arrested for like kidnapping an heiress to the Caterpillar family. Chris had led a life that was- What? Yeah, interstate, <laughs> interstate, interstate, interstate trafficking of a, a woman. That's the last I heard about Chris. Uh, he was dating this woman and they got in a fight and he grabbed her and drove across state lines with her. So the family, when you have that much influence, you can get a charge put on someone for whatever you want. There were so many memories of everything we did. You know, before, you know, we go with Mikey, let's hear what he had to say about one of these. It was pretty cool. A normal tour, you'd be, you leave at two in the morning, you drive six hours, you go to the next town, you plug up your shore power, you go to a hotel. It sounds simple, right? Yeah. It does. Yeah. <laughs> but with Warp Tour, Even though we could have done that, it was a different vibe. It was a different thing. It was like people were glad to be there. And so we'd drive, we'd get up at nine or 10 o'clock and drive to the next town, you know, and then we'd sit there and we would see the, it was like, you know, Arturo Vega told me one time, he said, you know, everybody knows Arturo, I'm sure. But he said, you know, he said, when I'm sitting here, And everything's quiet, and the show's over, the music's over, and the buses are sitting there. He said, all of a sudden, you hear one bus crank up. Then you hear two more crank up, and three or four. And he said, before you know it, there's a 100 buses cranked up like this monster coming alive. You'd sit there and just watch the buses pulling out. A lot of times, we would be like the last ones to leave to make sure everything was kind of good. But you just watch them one at a time, and then the city moves. Getting on a bus after a show... And you're like driving down an interstate and you're like, look at signs that say, oh, Atlanta this way, Louisville this way, oh, Memphis. Like, you know, you're going down these interstates and you just see those, I just, those highway songs and you know, sure. listen to music. And it was a feeling like, wow, you know, you're getting to actually do this. And I would just sit there and you'd be like, go to St. Louis, Boston, you know, Missouri. Oh, yeah. You know, it's true. You know, there's no better feeling than to think you're going to jump in a bus and you're going to go do a show the next day for one of those cities. Mikey was a m- musician too, so Mikey would play his music up front. He needs new strings. the blue since you've been gone now I'm sure gonna try this time Sure 
sure gonna try this time Gonna get over you But I Don't know if my heart Could take any more Drinking on the phone Never been alone Searching for a friend Taking everything you can Don't you see what is done? That was a song. That was a song that I wrote a couple of years ago with a friend of mine. Yeah. It's not like all these buses just show up. Like you don't just go like, oh, we need buses, and they just pop up. There's a lot of behind the scenes people that are involved, and we had some special people on Warp Tour. And I've mentioned Stuart Tiger before, um, and Stuart was working with Pennywise, and he worked for me. It's hard to describe Stuart if you didn't know him. He was one of a kind, but he passed away, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. When he was to our bus broker, we called him, bus broker, who went out and found all these buses for us because very few could, one company could provide all my buses. Plus, as we were starting to get into more unique drivers and sometimes drivers only would wanna drive, come back, or we needed different types of buses, you needed a central point. So when Stuart passed away, uh, his wife, Judy, well, Judy, we thought that we would keep her doing it that year. At least she could make the money that Stuart would have been made. Right. Even though we would do the majority of the work for her and just make sure she was compensated. You know, we all... It, it must have broke everybody's broke heart. Broke everyone's heart when we lost Stuart. But Judy was like, stepped in and started learning. But the way she handled it, she stepped in. And to this day, she's now a bus owner. Uh, she runs companies. She's still finds buses for people when needed. She's made a career of it. Organizing the logistics of the pickups and then doing inspections on the vehicles to make sure that they all met the safety requirements. And eat, all the safety requirements are given to us by the Department of Transportation. And so I think that when you're bringing vehicles in from multiple different vendors, you need to have a status or a status quo that you want for the buses for safety. So we did, we added vehicle inspections and interior inspections to make sure the operations of all of the things inside the bus are working properly, like, you know, electrical outlets for the clients to charge their phones and the televisions, the internet, just all the different amenities inside the bus. Um, and then just keeping the control over each vehicle, the number of passengers, and, you know, taking a little bit of, of stress off the driver because most of the buses in a production setting are packed. I mean, they're, they're up to 10 to 12 people, which is the max of beds. The hardest working drivers in the business, to be honest, because they, they just, they do the work. And that was something that there was no prima donnas on that tour. I mean, it's just, a, it's a hard tour, long, long drives and a lot of passengers, a lot of personalities. I would say colorful, <laughs> a colorful person, uh, people who liked a younger group of people because a lot of the marketing buses had a lot of new hires for these companies. So I think that was really important for us to have somebody who had tolerance of, of younger people. So that transition for her must have been, you know, hard initially. It sounds like she adapted well, but did she have to deal with all the craziness as most people do? You always have some sort of unfortunate incident and I asked her, you know, if she remembers something that happened, uh, you know, that, that kind of was out of the norm. You get calls all the time, this bus broke down. And then you got to figure out how to get a temporary bus in or transportation to get the bands to the next show. But I asked her about, you know, if she had any incidents stood out in her mind. I remember one specific time where I got a, actually I got photographs first of 
they were driving through Chicago and someone from an on-ramp, I think, or, or like a, an overpass on the freeway had launched in a frozen, like ice filled water balloon that they froze and it hit the windshield of one of the buses and cracked it. And it was some prankster person that was doing this on the highway in near Chicago. I think it was outside Joliet somewhere. That was terrifying to get that text of the photo of the driver and the glass had cut his face. And I mean, he made, you know, everything was fine. We were accident free, but these are things that are unexpected. One time we were leaving Nashville and a band called Jurassic Five. Um, Charlie Tuna was in that band. Charlie's very tall and he couldn't fit in a bunk. So he was sleeping in the front lounge and they had a bus accident that he was hurt very badly in. Oh, because he wasn't sleeping in the beds? He was hurt badly. But the one crazy one for me was a production driver we had. Anyone who drove on Warped Tour remembers Double G, George Gilbert. He's another one I wanted to interview, but seriously, he lives in the swamps in Georgia. And <laughs> just, it was just impossible to get him for this episode. I'm hoping one day to get him on because George is like, was my heart and soul. He was always a positive force. He always had a good attitude, but I'll never forget we were driving through, you know, coming out of like South Dakota, coming across up the Northern tier. I get a call that they hit a horse Ooh. in a bus. They, they hit with a full team of uh, sponsors and he was driving, always seemed to be driving the younger sponsorship. My daughter rode with him at times. Right. And, and me and George, you know, and all of a sudden we got this call that George, a horse had gotten out of its paddock and ran across the highway out in the middle of the night. And how fast were they going? And, um, I'm sure he was going 65. Jeez, that could wreck And a hit car. that bus, but he was able to get it over enough to where the horse flew up and hit the passenger side window and collapsed this, that corner of the bus and he was able to drive. Wow. And he got it over to the side of the road. Everyone called and brought everyone over and transferred passengers and everything. George had a, this bus up there. They brought it to the show. And that's where Boo jumped in and said, I could get this bus so at least you can drive oh, really? it. Get it out, yeah. But he, he got it back, but we had to lose George. George had to take, get this bus back. And I think he he limped that bus all the way back. I think if it would have been going back to Tennessee or Alabama or Georgia, one of those states, but from South Dakota, like he drove it back at like 45 miles an hour with no passengers. Do you, so these were all rented or leased, but you never owned... Any of these buses. I owned a bus for a while. And I did you? And I owned a bus uh, for a while. I tell you, it was probably the worst investment I ever did. <laughs> as yeah, many, many buses. It wasn't bus like a boat, was it? Well, it's kind of, yeah, kind of like a boat. <laughs> and I think a lot of bus drivers get themselves in trouble because, you know, they're paid, but then they hear what the rent on these buses are. Yeah. And they think like, oh, maybe if I can collect that, it's worth owning a bus. You know, owning a bus, you really have to be a great mechanic. Just like we talked, you said boat, you know. If you could work on your own boat, Great. Great. But if you have to call a mechanic to work on it every it's time, good. it's break out another thousand. We caught up with Jamie at JGM, and Jamie is actually a owner of a bus company, JGM Coaches. My business model has always been buy a nice bus for a fair price, maintain the bus. That's our biggest thing at JGM. Our focus is on taking care of our buses that we have, whether it's a 2005 or a 2017, give a, a band a good product a good driver, which you know, <laughs> and they're going to be happy with you. I always say, if you take an older coach that's maintained well with a great driver, you're gonna have a very happy band. You can take a brand new bus with a crappy driver and the client is going to complain because the driver doesn't know what he's doing. And I'm sure you, you know all about that. I'm sure you've had some good ones and bad ones and you've seen it over the years. Buses need maintenance, constant maintenance. We're talking 750,000 to a million dollar. Oh yeah, they're vehicles. expensive for sure. So, you know, I, but I asked because these bus drivers, we talk a lot, sometimes we ask about where you were in 2020 when this pandemic hit. Think about all these buses spread out all over the country and all these people, everyone was touring at that point. I asked Jamie as a bus owner what it was like in 2020. I was in the office, I was doing quotes, everything's normal, right? I was hearing a little bit of this stuff on the news about it and I'm like, oh, it's just whatever, you know, it wasn't a big deal, right? I remember when I, I was kind of watching the news in the office about it and when it came across, they were pulling on, it was uh, March Madness, NCAA basketball, they put, they said, there's, they're not going to be any fans. I remember I got up out of my seat. I walked out to the shop. My brother works out there and a couple other guys, my shop manager, Swiss. And I said to Swiss, I said, it's over. I said, everything's going to cancel. And Kevin, I'm not exaggerating. 
within an hour, I started getting phone call, email, phone call, email, phone call. And um, it was uh, every bus. Within two days, every bus come off the tour, except for, so this is a funny story, Harlow. Harlow was out, if I remember right, he was out driving a band called Silverstein. Oh, yeah. And they were down south. Yeah. And he kept saying to me, he kept calling me going, oh, we're not canceling our tour. They, they're not going to cancel it. They, <laughs> they were on the phone today, and they're not. I said, Harlow, I'm telling you, your tour is going to cancel. The next morning, he calls me, nope. They had a meeting last night, and they're not going to cancel. But then he got back to bus call that night, and he calls me. It was late. He calls me about 1 in the morning, wakes me up, and says, tour's canceled. We're coming home. <laughs> it wouldn't be a interview on bus trip unless you uh, interviewed Walter. Walter was a, uh, quite a character and someone who I really grew to like. So when did you first meet him? Was he on the tour initially or did he come later? He came in a little bit after a few years, but he, he was out there a long time. The most the tour buses that I was running at one time was 35. So, I mean, in the really early days, it was just friends, you know. But uh, later on, so I opened a shop in 89 right, called Busmaster, where we were converting them and fixing them and whatever. And so there would uh, there was always, I had musician friends, that were usually the roadie, on the roadie side, that, you know, had been musicians, but now they just worked. And, you know, they wanted to make some money. So, because you didn't do it being a musician, right? So they would come and work at the shop and they learned about the buses and then typically they would go out driving them too. So I always kind of had, that's how I made it work. I had people that weren't just bus drivers. They were mechanics. They had come from the music industry, you know, and then I had toured in Europe for years and because I always had a different take on doing everything in the United States than anyone else did. I was always the one that was supposedly going against the grain. I was just doing it the way they did in Europe, which worked, you know, which you've always, you, you're the exact same motherfucker, dude. You, you've always done your thing. You didn't do anything to challenge anything. You just looked at things and said, how could I do this better? You, you, you don't even think like, how could you do it better? You just look at it and go, okay, well, how should I do this? And you just figure it out. Like when you came up with the, the taste of chaos, dude, that people don't know about all the, sh all the fucking work you put into that and, and all the, the groundwork you tried to lay and all the stuff that was involved with that. That was amazing. Like that whole concept of everyone being involved and everyone sharing in it and using the venues at the off season so that you know they got used and people made money and i mean it, it was an amazing concept we were learning from each other how to do business we were all people who just kind of were figuring it out on the go but walter he had a unique fashion statement that made a few people like well you know about bus drivers <laughs> have a uh a really hard job and a very odd schedule and they have to have a certain type of temperament. Would you say that bus drivers have a little bit more specialness about them? Some of them, I think, are, are very happy on like a one bus tour. They, that they, they just drive a band, they go to their hotel. They might be loners, you know, they just right. like to be alone. Uh, there's others that are, are extremely, extremely social. And I think those those drivers that like that sociability gravitated to my projects. We always wonder why some of these guys wanted to go to a hotel at like, they drove, yes, they drove overnight. They want to go to a hotel at eight and they didn't have to be back till midnight the next day. Uh -huh. Like, they must have had girlfriends in every city or something, or meeting or something, <laughs> because it was like, you're not gonna, no one could sleep as much as you, like, going to your, like, important, it, it was that important to go to your hotel room. They must have had, like, side businesses they were running, or day traders. They always wanted to be, like, something was going on with them. I could never quite figure it out. One of the coolest things about Walter, he had a unique fashion statement I had to ask him about. I finally was like, what could I do to, like, further fuck with these people? Like, just throw a wrench in there. And I thought, what could I wear that would just mess with people's heads? And finally, I, I just thought, well, they have skirts for men. You know, that would be weird, like a kilt. So it took me forever to get one from Scotland. You know, this is early days of the Internet. And that's what started that whole thing was was that I I I literally started wearing those things just to fuck with people. And he'd wear this kilt and he'd have his boots on and then he'd have no shirt on and he had long, dark hair. And he had another thing. I go, you remember your other fashion statement? It was grease. He was always covered in grease. 
from working on, on buses. The buses because right? working on the buses. That's where I love that you, you could be a, not only the character on stage as an as artist, performer, but you would see these personalities. Like, where could you walk around with like no shirt and a kilt, covered in grease? Yeah, but here's the thing he's got to bend over and pick up my cables. He's got to reach around bus. I hope at least you mandated that he had something on under the kilt. Oh, no. Why would I not care? <laughs> no, I don't care. <laughs> Boy, have times changed. But, <laughs> but he always took care of his clients, you know? Eventually, I figured out, I was like, I need to research these people, right, first to see who I'm riding with, you know? Because usually some pretty amazing people. I mean, nine and a half times out of ten, you'd be amazed at the people that you're hauling around, you know? It's, it's pretty cool shit. So, you know, um, yeah, I, I used to do that, and I, I, would, I would look into – you know, stuff that people were into and, you know, like albums that they grew up, you know, like what influenced them musically or what influenced them. If it was an actor I was hauling around or whatever. And then I would typically, I would have those things on the bus. Like I would play that music or I would, you know, put on a movie or something to, I try, I always tried to, to bring people back to where it was that they started and why they were there. And, and I always wanted to remind people, I, I would tell people, man, it, you're at this amazing fucking point. And, I, and a lot of times you lose sight of it because of, especially because of the crew people that you're around or whatever that are constantly belittling shit and going, ah, oh, this is nothing. And who gives a fuck? And, da, da, da. and I'm like, dude, you, you realize what the fuck you've accomplished just to get to this point, you know, like this is amazing. And there's people outside the bus that want to talk to you and, have you sign shit and they come from all over the fucking world they buy your shit like this is a big deal man you know don't don't make it out to be like it's it's, it's not because it's a big fucking deal i think that's cool to have a bus driver that is is really thinking about this job but he's a fan is what well, he is and, and you're good that way because you like research people before we meet Hell with him. yeah and you always ask me like Hey, Kevin, who are we meeting? I go, I don't know, some dude wants to meet with us. And you're like, didn't you do any of your research? I go, no. I mean, I, I think I think you like to say that, but I know you do your homework too. I've been around long enough. But we did talk about something that really got a lot of buses, drivers in trouble. A driver would go to a bus company and say, I want my own bus. And the, and the bus companies a lot of times would go, okay, you're going to be paying us X amount a month to get this bus. And when you have that bus and you've paid it off, you're going to get the pink slip. They would fund it themselves. They would not go to a bank or anything. They would get it. I didn't realize that. So some of these bus drivers were subcontractors. So they they would have to pay for the use of the bus and then they would turn around. And you would pay the bus company for the bus. They would provide a driver. We put the drivers on our payroll that are driving their bus. That's you know how it usually worked. Sometimes you had an owner operator that actually owned the bus and drove the bus. And then you had this model where the bus drivers were, you know, they, they were making a, a, a few hundred bucks a day and the buses were selling, you know, running for four to $600 a day. And the drivers would sit up late at night and go, well, if I was collecting that four or $600 a day, I could actually should own my own bus. Now the bus companies were notorious for saying, yeah, sure. I've got a bus you can buy from me at 6% interest or 7% interest or more. That's I think it's 10, robbery. 12% uh, interest. That's nuts. And these drivers would go, all right. And they'd figure it out. Oh, I have to be driving the bus. And ooh, I, if I work 16 days a month, it'll work. But then you don't take into effect the wear and tear, all the maintenance and all this stuff. So you missed a payment or two payments. And then the bus companies would just repo the bus back from the drivers. So me and Walter caught up on that. They would come up with the down payment, which was you know, some tour support money from the tour. And then, you know, Jerry was like, okay, it's, you're paying me 20,000 a month, you know, but you get to keep the driver's pay, you know? And then he did the simple interest, which was this compound simple interest, you know? So by the time, <laughs> you know, within, you know, five years, you paid $2 million, $3 million for this bus. You know, people didn't understand that stuff going into it. That's a scam. It was a scam. And it was this company out of Florida that would, would do this with the drivers a lot. And I know drivers who got in trouble. And, and I stepped in a couple of times and helped the drivers like get rid of the bus or bought the bus, try to make it work. It got a lot of bus drivers in trouble. I'm you sure know? it did. It got a lot of them in trouble. Then we had some discussions about the cost of buses were just going up and up and up. They want more and more features on the bus. You know, you wanted air doors that when they sound like Star Trek, when you push the button versus opening a door. But that just kept adding more and more money. 
and more and more things that could break. I always like simpler buses with less things to break on them. But I did ask Walter before we left, you know, does he remember any funny stories? Of course there was Stuart, you know, rest his soul. Yeah, I mean, Stuart was, he was a, a force on his own, you know, a very unique guy. Like, I mean, uh, you know, you had the old timers that came from, what's her name? You know, that drove the, the sports team buses. Oh yeah, like, yeah. Like you know, Charlie. Like Charlie, well, Charlie and Harry Wells and, Remember, I think Charlie was pulled. Well, they, one day they, they got yes. a, they pulled a knife on each other what? <laughs> exactly. in, the, just in the parking lot. Too. That's right. That reminded me. I'll have to. We'll have to touch on that story of two seven-year-old dudes pull knives on each other. Yeah, God. Uh, yeah. I'll never forget. Like, hey, Kevin, you better get over there, Charlie. And they're gonna kill each other with a, and they like the knives in the parking lot. It's amazing. I was like, holy shit. These old dudes are going to go at it, man. Well, at that point, you just got to call the cops. They were in their 70s and they were driving. This is probably right when they were leaving driving. And they got their knives out in the parking lot. And they're going to fight each other. We just walked over to me and Sully. I took one guy's knife away. Sully took the other guy's knife away. Brought him over the tent. Gave me each a beer. And talked about what the problem was. And, and the problem was, it was like one was driving bus number 16. And one was driving like bus number 17. And he went, number 17, went in front of number 16. How into the park. dare like, you? Oh, yeah. It was it was worth a... I'm going to pull out my knife and cut you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That was always a great way to start the morning. Like, the first call of the morning <laughs> was like, ah, you know, okay, another day on tour. Just those bus drivers, Double G, Boo, all of these people. Harry Wells. I met him through the years. Many of them have passed away. We had this driver, Ted Carr, who was a fabulous person who came out. And he would hang out with us. And he came up until the last, he would come out and visit. He was good friends with Steve. He drove Steve Van Doren's bus. Oh, cool. So he would always, Ted Carr would come out and help out and, and just be around the tour for right. many, many years. Wanted to be there for four or five days, even when he stopped driving. So I miss Ted Carr. I know he's living, enjoying his life out near Asheville, North Carolina. I tell the bus drivers, Call me up when you're coming through LA. I'm always got a place at a barbecue and a talk. And when I, you get two or three of them in a the backyard. It, it's hard to duplicate those stories. Just, it also sounds to me, I mean, maybe Lollapalooza is still doing it, but I think this is, it's over. You know, I don't well, think no, you're going to have. Lollapalooza is just Chicago. You're not, uh, yeah, you're not going to have a hundred vehicles on the road moving. You know what it reminds me of? It's the worst analogy in the world. I know, but it reminds me of like a captain of an aircraft carrier with all those people having to move in one direction together. And you had to, to be the captain of that ship, but you depended on people to do their jobs. And you had to delegate. You couldn't possibly do it all. And this is just one part of it. And I think it's kind of sad that it's not going to, that experience that those people had, it's never coming back. I do miss those mornings hanging out with those guys, you know, and uh, it was a great part of, touring and some people wouldn't believe but i go the part i miss most a lot of times was hanging out with those guys i wanted to ask you kevin are there any bands out there that you've been listening to this week that we should be aware of a student of mine that just sent me some great songs his name's kane acosta and i like what he's playing it's kind of that surf sound he's getting his good sound together so let's just listen to some demos from kane acosta and um, i think he's gonna have a nice little run he's starting to really form his sound k-a-n-e acosta um, I also was talking to people this week. We had a, a guest in one of my classes, uh, Taylor Testa, who is with Universal Publishing right. and is an, uh, was an intern of mine when she was very young. And we're talking about the level of talent that's been coming out of the USC campus. And she goes, we're all talking about it. That's great. Uh, there was 24K Golden had a big run. There's a new girl named Madeline. Didn't you mention that the USC just had the kids over there kind of put on their own show? It's this up and coming genre what what is the genre that you and Xavier were talking about? It's, not up and coming. it's, it's, been, it's been around, but hyper pop. Hi, I'm an old person. Hyper pop. With <laughs> new, is it like new wave? Because I like that new wave stuff. Let me tell you, it's really fun for me to see the talent level and then the level of the shows. Because on the on the same end as the artists, you've got crews of kids and students putting together properties and shows, and their level and their shows are growing. We've kind of explained how bus drivers work. Maybe we just do bus driver stories. So if you're a bus driver out there and you're listening to this, driving down, you know, the I-70 one night, uh, like Harlow does. He said he's been listening to uh, a lot of our podcasts uh, when he's driving. 
reach out to me. I'd love to record your story. Yeah, and thanks to everyone for listening. And make sure you subscribe on Spotify, Apple, and YouTube, and leave us a review. Remember, we are also not just recording this as a podcast, but this is video production as well. So now Spotify is letting those videos up. So you can check out Diego and Tony's beautiful studio. This is where we record all our lovely stuff, and you can see that online too. Give a shout out to Chris Gilbert for joining us on Patreon, and thank you to all our guests for joining us on this episode. And follow us on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and Facebook to see my weekly cooking and gardening tips. If you want more My Warp Life content, subscribe to our Patreon and a subscription is only five bucks, and you can stop anytime if you want. And text us any topics you want to hear more about. 818-863-6445. Well, you had me right. And you done me wrong. Wrapped around your little finger, nice and tight. Yes, I called your number I got a busy tone When I write you a letter And never find you home Yes, and while we're talking Let me ask you to Where the well are you going so late at night? This time I'll agree If you're practicing to deceive Two wrongs now, baby Just might make it right You pick me up 